Hello, today we will be learning about surrealism and what surrealism is in a nutshell is it's basically an art movement which was concerned with the expression of the subconscious mind. Today we're going to uh, find a little bit more about um, the beginnings of surrealism. And like where it came from, what movements it arose from, mm -hmm. and the artists, the major artists in the movement. And, uh, and the, also the impact and influence that surrealism has on today, today's yes. on today's society. So we hope you enjoy our presentation. We may be goofy at times, um, just as a warning. But um, we hope that after you watch this video, you'll be well informed about surrealism, and maybe you'll be uh, even more interested in the movement. So yeah, with that, uh, we hope you enjoy our video. Okay, so Surrealism took place in the late 1910s and early 1920s and ended around the 1950s. So basically it started, um, it's, it finds its roots in um, a post-World War One era. Right? Yeah, the reason why like it took place in that time was because World War One was going on and um, Dada came out of World War One because they were angry about everything that was happening mm -hmm. in World War One and how they were treating people. Basically, Dadaism was a movement that sprung from the protest against the violence of World War One, and it was a way for artists to do the opposite of what everyone else wanted to do because they wanted to separate themselves from the world that they were disgusted with, but like basically because they didn't like World War One. And uh, so, but surrealism was not as carefree and cynical as the Dada movement, but it definitely did ignore logic. So surrealist members saw that um, rationalism brought destruction upon uh, European culture and politics, and surrealism was basically uh, a movement in reaction to that. And some of the key players in surrealism was Sigmund Freud, um, Karl Marx, and Andre Breton, not because they participated in the movement, but many surrealists valued their ideas. Like Sigmund Freud, um, the surrealists were very into his psychoanalytic um, ideas, and that made that way made their way into their art. And they believed in communism and Marxist theories. And Andre Breton kind of initiated the movement in some way because mm -hmm. he wrote the Manifesto of Surrealism. And he basically defined what surrealism was, and that was kind of making it known to the world that surrealism is starting to arise. Surrealism originated as a literary movement. They experimented with automatic writing, which sought to release the unbridled imagination of the subconscious, but eventually it's made its way into the visual arts. Yeah, and they had, we'll talk about the techniques of the artists later, but Automatism was a big thing in surrealism because it eliminated them thinking about what they were putting down on a canvas. They put it... Oh. Well, it allowed them to basically tap into their unconscious mind. Um, and it was a way for them to express um, what they had inside, what, they, what, what their sub subconscious was by just basically randomly... Putting um, stuff, yeah, on, putting their stuff on their art. Yeah. The um, the first exhibition of surrealist um, art was held um, in 1925, but in Europe uh, the ideas of surrealism were um, rejected initially. Um, Andre Breton uh, set up an international exhibition of surrealism in New York, and uh, there in New York, uh, New York then became the center of, surre of surrealism and took the place of Paris. And soon uh, after, uh, surrealis surrealism ideas were given new life and became an influence over young artists, uh, in the, especially in the United States and in Mexico. And these uh, surre surrealist ideas were bold and new to the art world. Okay, so now we're going to go into the techniques and the methods that surrealist artists use, and it'll kind of help you guys um, di differentiate surrealist um, art from other art movements and um, we'll talk about the subjects that they like to paint and um, the different processes that they used for their art. 
So surrealism was kind of split into two major groups. Um, the veristic surrealists who painted dreamlike images in a literal way. And then there were also artists um, that were considered calligraphic surrealists who designed art through automatic writing. And we talked about automatism earlier. And um, Mar Juan Miro, which we'll talk about later, he was considered a calligraphic artist. And Rene Magritte um, and Salvador Dali were veristic surrealists. So most surrealists like to paint objects, paint pictures of common objects, but in weird positions and perspectives. And some artists in the movement did abstraction, and others used symbolism. Um, some of the some of the uh, subject matters that surrealist artists um, try to depict in their paintings were um, mostly mysterious, mythological, and unorthodox, and they included images of sexuality, decay, and violence in many of their works. So, surrealism had a lot of recurrent themes of violence and annihilation throughout uh, many of their works. And this really shocked viewers, um, especially uh, shocked viewers with depictions of mutilated, dismembered, or distorted bodies. They also used um, random combinations of found objects that they combined in their surrealist assemblages reve that revealed the fraught sexual and psychological forces that they believe were hidden just beneath the surface of reality. Some artists also depicted morphing objects like um, animal heads morphing into human bodies, and you'll see that in almost every surrealist artist that we will go over today. So we talked about Andre Breton and how he kind of Breton. made surrealism made known to the world, That's it. That's it. but um, Breton, a writer himself, he used automatic writing, which is kind of a way to mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. release the subconscious. He immediately wrote thoughts that popped into his head, so it didn't really make mm -hmm. sense. And a way of experimenting with automatism is this technique that surrealists use called the exquisite corpse. And um, it was an exercise to let one's thoughts free, just like automatic writing was, but it was a source of drawing. And they, the Surrealists had like a lot of different techniques that they would use, and one of them is called decalcomania, which was pressing a sheet of paper onto a painted surface and then peeling it off again to make a certain texture and look to it. Oh, <laughs> um, so another um, technique that the Surrealists used was, uh, was called frottage, is that right, Cindy? Frottage! So it's frottage? <laughs> so basically, what you want to do is you want to scrape pigment across the canvas, and it, make sure that it's laid on a textured surface. You want to heat it up to about 500 degrees, you want to add your paprika to it, and you want to pop that baby out about 4-5 or five hours. It should be good to go. So, this has been Paula Dean's <laughs> buttered chicken recipe. Okay, but um, all jokes aside, um, there was uh, a big emphasis on going against the socially acceptable, acceptable values of art. That's why they used all these weird unorthodox methods like frittage and decalcomania. So after we've gone over the techniques of surrealists, we're going to go over historical events that was having happening around surrealism and also other artists that we're not going to stress too much, um, but we're going to mention other artists that were in the surrealist movement, but not as active as like Salvador Dali or Max Ernst, which we're going to talk about later, but um, and also how surrealism gained its popularity. Okay, so surrealism gained its fame through a series of exhibitions in and out of uh, many countries around the world. Their first, uh, the first Surrealist exhibition took place at the Gallery Pierre in Paris in 1925. And there were also galleries um, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York that sparked more popularity for Surrealists and it was around 1936 and 1937. Uh, another <laughs> Surrealist was Yves Tan Eve's tan guy was a tan guy. <laughs> oh my god. He joined the Surrealist movement in 1925 and he later began painting psychoanalytic landscapes. Mm -hmm. yes. 
And so we did talk about how the movement started out as a group of poets, but the first visual surrealist artists were Max Ernst, Andre Masson, Juan Miro, and Man Ray. And two of those artists we're going to talk to, talk about in a couple seconds. Okay, so some of the major painters um, in the surrealist movement were painters like Jean Arp, uh, Max Ernst, uh, Andre Masson. Rene Magritte, uh, Yves, Yves Tangai. Tangai, Salvador Dali, Pierre Roy, Paul Duval, and Juan oh, Miro. Complicated names. Um, and then, so Man Ray, he wasn't a painter, but he was a photographer, and he was um, considered a surrealist, and um, he was also a Dadaist photographer. Um, he, his techniques were um, cameraless images, and he, one of his famous works was Le Violin des Endres, which is in French, I can't really pronounce it. Um, and it was this woman, and it was the back of her body, and she's sitting down, and there's two F holes from a violin painted on her back to make her look like sort of a violin, capturing the figure of the woman. And then Marcel Duchamp, which we all know because we talked about it in class, uh, he was a surrealist and Dada. Dada, Dada is mm -hmm. sculptor yes, Dada. and painter who invented ready mades which we all know, like fountain and then bicycle and stuff like that. So that kind of goes with like the orthodox ideas that were invented mm -hmm. by the Dadaists and, and surrealists. Yeah. So now we're gonna get into um, Max Ernst. <laughs> and so Max Ernst, he was a painter, a sculptor, and a printmaker from Germany. And he, he had an interest in dreamlike imagery and illogical subjects. Um, he didn't paint what he dreamt, like most artists um, in the surrealist movement. He painted his weird perception of the world. And so, he, but he gets his um, he he gets his um, influence from being in, in World War One and um, all of the experiences that happened to him during the war. All of the nightmares that happened to him kind of shaped um, the kind of works and uh, style and subjects that he painted about. So Max Ernst, he served in the German army for four years in World War I, so it made him see the world in different ways because of all the stuff that he saw going on, mm -hmm. because it was, you know, pretty messed up stuff. Pretty cool. Yep. Terrible, terrible. Yeah. He uh, also studied at the University of Bonn? I don't know. Focusing on philosophy, psychology, psychiatry, literature, and art history, which made him like a better artist and everything going on. And it made him know about psychology, which is a big influence towards the Surrealist movement. Wait, so <laughs> he went to school? <laughs> Yeah. Really? Because yeah. I researched it and it said that he didn't go to school. Are he was we still recording this? Can we not? He was self-taught, but he's self-taught um, in the way of teaching himself how to, art, how to do art. Oh. <laughs> and <laughs> but he did go to school for those other things. You right, Cindy. You right. <laughs> okay, so Max Ernst, he became increasingly preoccupied preoccupied with painting. Like Sydney said, um, he went to school at the University of Bonn, but for the most part, he was self-taught in his painting, in his paintings, uh, influenced by Van Gogh and Mack. Um, he developed the technique of fraudage, like we talked about a bit earlier, and that was basically laying paper on the floor and rubbing over it with pencil to create the textual, the textural effect of wood. Um, Max Ernst used frittage as a way to eliminate the conscious control of the artist, which we have mentioned before. And um, frittage also provided him with a means of evoking hallucinatory visions. <clears throat> he also had a method of... <laughs> he started using um, collages. Uh, he demonstrated dreamlike scenarios in his works before the official establishment of the Surrealism Movement. 
and he cut out details from other sources to create a collage effect, which introduced a new visual effect to surrealism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's really famous for his collages, and mm -hmm. he has a book of collages that he has done. Um, er Ernst reworked mundane materials, um, such as manuals on botany to create stunning images. He um, had an alter ego, which was called the Lop Lop, which is kind of like a bird man, because when he was a child, he was confused about birds and humans and death and all that. This is pretty weird stuff. <clears throat> and the Lop Lop uh, is incorporated into a lot of his paintings. Yeah, you'll see it in really weird distorted images. Um, Ernst became one of the Surrealist Movement's founding members after fleeing to Paris in 1922 after the First World War. He escaped from the war, fascism, and, uh... <laughs> and the internment camps. And the internment camps in France and fled to the U.S. in 1941. It was in New York City where he, along with other European Surrealists, began to inspire the emergence of abstract expressionism. Um, Ernst established a growing population, oh, population, <laughs> reputation, <laughs> and a critical following in three different countries, uh, these countries being Germany, France, and the U.S., in the span of his whole career. So, so um, he's a very uh, well-known and established artist. Okay, so Ernst's um, arrival in New York during World War II in 1941 along with other European avant-garde painters um, like Duchamp, uh, electrified a generation of American artists. It really inspired them and um, inspired and um, influenced many young artists and their styles. The rejection of traditional painting in favor of one's own unique techniques um, really captivated many young American painters. So, Max Ernst, he had, you know, a lot of paintings over his whole career, but just a few of his most famous works were Celebes? Celebs. Celebs. We think. And then Dadaville. And then also Pieta, which is, uh, or Revolution by Night. Okay, so now we're going to go into the analysis of some of Max Ernst's um, major works. And we're going to do this for um, the next three artists that we're going to be doing later. And first we'll give you our initial perception and analysis of the paintings that we give you. And then um, we will give you the actual analysis to give you more insight on the works that we show you for each artist. Okay, so this painting... Um, is by Max Ernst. It's called Celebes or the Elephant Celebs. Of Celebes or Celebs. Yeah, yeah. Um, pronunciation is a problem in this video. Um, and <clears throat> to us, it's I don't know. All I see is an elephant. Yeah, there's. It looks. It definitely <laughs> looks like an elephant, but I, I don't know if like this like coil thing. I don't know what to call if it. If it's a chunk or something. Yeah. It looks no. sort of like, it looks like a mix trunk. between an elephant and some kind of machine because yeah, it looks it, kind of geometric it definitely you look at looks its body. Like, it definitely looks like <clears throat> metallic in some way. Like it looks like it's made out of like metal. Mm -hmm. To me at least. And also like the top of like the elephant kind of looks like a uh, like a helmet maybe like um, in like a war or something like that. Yeah. And it's oh. really dark too. Like there's a See the back yeah. of it is very gray. It looks and like something is falling out of the sky. Yeah, it looks like something's falling out of the sky in the top and right I think corner. It kind of <laughs> looks like there's airplanes in the sky. I'm not sure what like those things are on top of the elephant, or what seems to be like an elephant. And there is a naked lady with no head. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of like a Barbie doll without a head. For some reason, that's what I see, like some kind of like mannequin body. Yeah. So there's definitely <laughs> things that do not relate with each other. Just I think so just Ernst surreal. Yeah, Ernst just put it all together to make a collage. Yeah. So for this painting, um, the themes of dream 
and knights are are widely present in Salibs, and the the painting shows a sh like a strange a strange dreamscape dominated by a, a large monster, half elephant, half machine, whatever you want to call it. Um, it has a long curling trunk that culminates in a horned head shaped like a woman's chest, and there's also two other trusts tusks that protrude from its left side, um, probably suggesting a second head or perhaps a tail. So um, this painting exudes a threatening atmosphere, a really like a frightening, very scary tone. And this was, this is linked to um, Ernst, Ernst's um, traumatic experience uh, at the German front line. Uh, in the First World War, and as we talked about earlier, he he served um, as a soldier in both world wars. So there's a lot of experiences and traumatic events that um, really influence his artwork and his style. So on top of the elephant's body is um, a mechanical contraption with a single eye emerging eerily, kind of looking like a periscope. Um, other holes or eyes are visible throughout the painting, and this implied a preoccupation with sight and sightlessness, which, which in the surrealist view was related to the inner sight of the un unconscious mind. Um, the twilight setting also suggests the, the transition between day and night, uh, basically the waking world and dream, when ordinary objects begin to be transformed in the unconscious. And also, as you can see in the foreground, is a headless woman, or or mannequin, and this sort of beckons to the elephant, as if calling him further into the world of fantasy. The cutout shapes and disjointed imagery clearly relate to Ernst's use of collage from 1919 and onwards, but the translation of this technique into painting was really inspired by the medical metaphysical landscapes of Giorgio de Chirico, uh, an Italian painter. Ernst, be Ernst began to imitate um, a lot of uh, Chirico's illogical juxtaposition of objects and his eerie enigmatic settings, and we see this. Um, we see that this is present within um, within Salibs with um, all of the unrelated objects and um, just like the the um, the ominous and, fr and frightening tone that he portrays in this piece. So this painting was um, meant to show the fear and irrationality in one's mind during war and the irrationality of the war itself. Um, Ernst, you know, having served in World War One, was um, deeply affected by it and um, this gave him more insight as to the mind of one um, while he was at war. So, while the elephant um, was interpreted to represent um, the fear inducing British tanks being seen for the first time, the headless woman that's in the painting um, likely represents Ernst's sister, whose death traumatized him, and um, in reality, a tank and Ernst's dead sister would never appear side by side in his life. But inside Ernst's mind during the war, these thoughts were mixed together with the rationality of reality separating them. So overall, um, the Elephant Salibs is an excellent depiction of Ernst um, with his unconscious mind, one that was very disturbed, um, one that was disturbed because of the World War. So on to our second painting, um, this painting is called The Fireside Angel. This, if you look at this painting, it's actually kind of creepy. It really like, is creepy. The creature, which is depicted here, is actually, yeah, it's really creepy. Sort of a bird man creature, which we learned is a called a lop-lop. Um, so... I don't know, like, 
Kind of looks like there's like a second figure coming out of his leg at yeah, the bottom there. I see that. Kind of looks like he's dancing in it some way, like celebrating like something. I think like, it's like a yeah. like a contradiction because the creature is like really like menacing and ugly, but his like if you look at his eyes, it's kind of like a happy like squinting. Oh, it does look. You know like, what I mean? Yeah, it does look like that. And the background is like cheerful. And I'm kind of confused about like the clothing it's wearing. Um, yeah, it's very colorful. Yeah, very mm. colorful. Okay, so now for the real analysis. Um, the Fireside Angel uh, is depicting a fiery monster that represents a wave of, of fascism that overtook Europe in the mid 20th century. Ernst saw realism as a means of transcendence from the horrors of war. Um, among the most common are forests and doves and a and a fantasy bird-like creature which we see in this in this painting. And this bird-like creature is actually called uh, Lop Lop. <laughs> it sounds funny, but Ernst often depicted himself as a dove or would use um, a Lop Lop as a form of, of uh, narration and self-commentary. So going back to um, fasc fascism, this, this painting is one of the few in Ernst's career that were actually inspired from um, <laughs> political events. Um, Ernst painted Fireside Angel um, shortly after the defeat of the Spanish Republicans in the Spanish Civil War. And in this conflict, Spanish fascist leaders were supported by Germany and Italy in their victory. So Ernst's goal was to depict the chaos that he saw spreading all over Europe and the ruin and, the ruin and destruction that fascism um, brought to, to countries. So it, it seems kind of contradictory that Ernst used a title like Fireside Angel, you know, something very positive, even though this is actually a picture about something very destructive, very, very scary and frightening. But Ernst actually uses the title um, on this painting to aid in evoking a sense of chaos and destruction. The use of the word angel, you know, confuses an observer at first due to the abstract and grotesque figure that uh, that is the painting subject um, but Ernst forces the viewers mind to think of these elements in a biblical sense Ernst draws his audience to imagine the angel in the painting as if it were the angel of death from the seven plagues or a beast unleashed at the end of days it appears that Ernst is even provoking his audience to question their own beliefs, you know, by calling such a figure an angel. So it's very contradictory. This defies um, to how angels are traditionally portrayed, you know, because, you know, uh, when we hear the, the word angel, you know, we, we generally think about something very beautiful and majestic and, and peaceful. Um, but the angel that is depicted in his work is is in contrast um, to the monster that Ernst created. So basically, the use of, of of this title was to was a direct ploy to intrigue and engage his audience with his work. So the angel doesn't um, feature a single main color in its depiction, but instead Ernst uses um, colors from across the entire spectrum. The use of oil to paint the picture hides the brush strokes, which gives the figure a more fluid look. And he also incorporates uh, a mix of faded and defied lines to obscure the image in some areas, which causes the viewer to observe the painting more carefully in those places. The use of shading and diagonal lines helps to portray the idea of this giant moving clumsily and rapidly across a proverbial European wasteland, and also the lack of uniform uniformity creates a feeling of chaos that strongly impacts the viewer. Um, Ernst's use of dark color for the spawning figure portrays the cruelty and the darkness that was inherent in the governments, such as the Nazi party, and we all know how evil they were. Um, Ernst's fear of fascist governments is portrayed in this image. And uh, this was portrayed by the newly forming angel from the pre-existing figure, the, the, that like blob that you see coming from the, the angel's leg. 
Ernst predicted, he actually predicted the chaos and destruction that would be caused by World War II in Fireside Angel. He saw that, uh, what he saw what could happen if fascist governments were allowed to spread and not being controlled by other more liberal powers. So when, when reflecting back on this painting, uh, Max Ernst could not believe that what he depicted about the outcome of Europe um, after the Spanish Civil War had actually become true. Max Ernst portrayed his his cautionary tale um, in, in a way that was that was characteristic of surrealism, yet it was practical enough and simple enough for the ordinary man and the, and the regular viewer to get the thoughts behind his artwork. So overall, Ernst um, painted this piece uh, as a statement basically ex explaining uh, how the corruption and um, the evil fascist governments in, in, the, in Europe and in the world would, would spread and it, and it would only make the world worse. And it's really eerie and um, it's really eerie to think that his depiction and his prediction um, in this painting actually became true with the outbreak of the Second World War. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and get into our second artist. Uh, our second artist is Juan Miro. Um, Juan Miro, uh, was, he was a Spanish painter, a sculptor, and a ceramist. He was originally from Barcelona, Spain, but he moved to Paris at an early age. And there in Paris, France, he, that's where he began to develop in an unconventional style of work. Uh, he was very much against the established painting methods of the time and he is often credited with being the founder of automatic drawing. Miro became famous um, in the community as a surrealist because of his love for automatism and the use of sexual symbols in much of his work. <laughs> okay, so now that we're talking about Miro, um, we're gonna talk about some of his works and maybe do like an analysis. Um, of some of his paintings and so the first one we're gonna go over is the tilled field and um, Boop. <laughs> There it is and um, I guess we'll just get started Jason, okay, so uh, At first glance you can see there's a lot of um, use of lines um, I see There's a lot going on. There's a lot of color of lot, a lot of light and like contrasting colors. Looks like there's an ear coming out of the tree. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that means the earth is listening. I don't know. <laughs> um, and I noticed that like I've seen other like Moreau's other work, and his is more abstract. And this is definitely not like realist, realistic or anything. But um, this one seems to have more like value than other work that Moreau has, like, some of his paintings have, um, they're just basic shapes and solid colors, but this one he has a lot of blending and different values, and that's why I know this one's a little different. Um, um, there's definitely a lot of symbolism in this image, um, and hopefully we'll find out more about that later. Um, overall, I think that it's a pretty good painting. I don't know if I would hang this up on my wall, but... <laughs> it's definitely not his, one of his normal paintings, I'd say. Yeah, so the tilled field is, he started painting it during the summer of 1923, and he painted it as a view of his family farm, which was in ah. Montreux, Catalonia. Catalonia. Catalonia, if ah. that's how you pronounce it. And it is, it kind of relates in a way to some of his earlier paintings, but oh, really? it's yeah, <laughs> but uh, it's his first example of his surrealist vision, and it's um, it's fanciful juxtapose of human, animal, and vegetal forms. Okay, I see that. Yeah, and it's a ray of schemat schematis. Don't know how to say this word. <laughs> schematized creatures um it constitutes like 
a realm that you can only see through your mind, like in your imagination. Oh yeah. And <clears throat> so well, all of this is going in his mind. Is yeah, it his mind? all yeah. of it is just coming out of his mind, mm -hmm. and it's like a made-up version of his family's farm. Yeah, it's his mind's perception of yeah. what okay. he saw. Okay. I okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I like I noticed that we like people classify Miro as a surrealist artist. But a lot of people think that he's like borderline extract ex abstractionism, and I saw I saw his work as more ab abstract. But this painting definitely de demonstrates his use of surrealism. And that's pretty much what the the uh, the basis of surreali surrealism is: is painting what yeah, you, how you painting perceive things through your in subconscious. What's in your subconscious? What's in your head? Ay. And I think Miro did a good job of that. Well, and going back to that, he said. While he was working on the painting, he wrote, I have managed to escape into the absolute of nature. So he just in escaped, his mind just escaped into the farm and what he saw, and he just painted it how he imagined it, just think thinking about it. Um, and that kind of explains automatism. I'm not sure if um, that's what he was trying to go for, but his automatism is all about just putting right what you think and just putting it right on the canvas uh the so this painting is like a poetic metaphor that expresses his idyllic view and conception of his homeland and he said about his homeland he could not conceive of the wrongdoings of mankind so the complex symbolism of the tilled field has a lot of sources which attests to Nero's long-standing interest in his artistic heritage so where he came from in it like in his art in his beginning he just kept growing and like painting different things and just yeah the and then the muted contrasting tones of the painting they somewhat recall the colors of where he came from like his culture and his country and then if you look at the painting, it somewhat seems like it's not going back into the landscape. It seems like it's going up. It's very 2D. It's not. Yeah, it's very depth. 2D. There's no depth to the painting. And so, in the painting, you can see how there's a lot of decorative, like colorful everywhere, animals, colorful yeah. animals, multicolored animals, and mm -hmm. they most likely were inspired by medieval Spanish tapestries. All of these creatures that you can see in the painting, once again, are derived from Catalan ceramics, which are kind of like where Miro came from. Uh, they... Oh, and he... Because he collected them in a studio and he saw them every day, so he just... They were in his mind, so that could be why they came out in his painting. So in the middle right of the painting, just next to the tree, the thing that kind of, the animal that looks like an ox or a bull, that has its source in the prehistoric cave paintings of Altamira, which Miro knew very well. Even the enormous eye that is peering through the foliage of the pine tree and the, um, Kind of looks like a pine tree. Yeah, kind of <laughs> looks like a pine tree. And then the eye-covered pine cone beneath it, if you can find that, it's a little iffy. <laughs> <laughs> but it, these can be traced to examples of early Christian art in which the wings of angels were covered in many tiny eyes. And also, Miro found something special and like alive and magical in all things, which the gigantic ear, which is connected to the tree, left side of the tree, left side of the tree. It, for example, reflects his belief that every object contains a living soul. Also in this painting, The Tilled Field, there's some political content. So if you see in kind of the upper left corner, I don't know how to describe that, but if you see the birds, look down to the right, and there are three flags, which are the French, Catalan, and the Spanish. And this is referring to Catalonia's attempt to secede from the Spanish government. And 
by depicting the Catalan and French flags on the opposite side of the Spanish flag, Miro was announcing, was announcing his allegiance to the Catalan cause. Okay, so now that we analyzed one of the pieces of Miro, you kind of get um, an idea of like the heritage and um, the places that um, Miro grew up in just in one painting. Okay, so now that we went over the analysis of the tilled field, we'll go into another work by Miro called The Birth of the World. Okay, so at a first glance, The Birth of the World by Miro looks pretty ominous. Looks really sad. Yeah, with a lot of like dark shades. <laughs> um, the only like light colors that he has is the balloon. Like the It looks like with, a balloon, yeah, yeah. With the yellow string and the blue I mean the blue the red circle. To me it kinda of makes me think about like when he says the birth of the world, it makes me think about how like I don't know if depending on if you're religious or not, we learn about how the world started from nothing and it kinda of looks like this, how it's like just dark and grey, but then something, um, whether it be the Big Bang Theory or God creating the world, um, it's kind of looks like the red dot is like the little something that the world came out of. Um, I noticed in this painting though, he did use the normal shapes that I've seen in other works um, because the tilled field is, like I said, it was a lot different than um, his other works and this one seems more typical for Miro. The Birth of the World, which is this painting, was painted in 1925. And in this painting, Miro places totally, totally abstract geometric forms on a picture surface that has been stained and scarred as though like it has been attacked and like beaten and torn apart in Poor some painting. way. Which is weird, but you know. <laughs> Surrealism, that's what it is. But Miro's, his real struggle in these years, which is depicted by this painting, was he wanted to detach his subject from the ground it was painted on. So he kind of wanted to detach his paintings from the um, surface canvas. Oh, I can see yeah. that. And t he, wanted it, he wanted to do this to allow these abstract forms to float free of the canvas's gravitational pull, if you understand what I'm saying. About this painting, Miro said that it depicts a sort of genesis, so a kind of beginning of life. And to make this work, Miro poured, brushed, and flung paint unevenly on a printed canvas, which I said he'd already kind of beaten up and torn up in some way. And so that the paint soaked in some areas and rested on top in others. Um, and atop this uncontrolled application of paint, he added lines and shapes he'd previously planned for the painting in his studies, like thinking about the painting and what he was going to do. And then the bird or kite that you see is, um, or shooting star or whatever you see, the balloon and the figure with the white head. Mm -hmm. It may seem somehow familiar to each other, but their association is illogical. There's no reason behind it or anything. It's just, he just put it there. And then, just when he was describing his method for this painting, he said, Rather than setting out to paint something, I began painting. And as I paint the picture, it begins to assert itself, or suggest itself, under my brush. The first stage is free, unconscious. So, in conclusion, um, The Birth of the World and The Tilled Field are two of Juan, Juan Moreau's most well-known pieces. So now we're going to go ahead and get started on René Magritte. He was born in the provincial town of Lesines in Belgium. He moved to Brussels in 1916 and he studied at the Académie des Beaux Arts and during the 1920s, he experimented with different avant-garde styles, such as Cubism and Orphism. Uh, so while some French uh, surrealists led uh, pretty extravagant lives, Magritte preferred the quiet middle-class existence, um, a life symbolized 
by the, the many bowler-hatted men in many of his works. In 1927, Magritte moved to Paris to join the Surrealists. There are many things in René Magritte's past that kind of influenced his um, work during the Surrealist movement, but when he was younger, um, he was really fascinated with magicians, so I guess that kind of made him um, fascinated with illusions, mm -hmm. which he plays with illusions a lot in his artwork. And when he was younger, um, his mom died when, in 1912 when he was about 14. Oh, that's so sad. <laughs> Yeah, why am I laughing? Um, and the feelings that he got about her death um, made way into its paintings, like this painting called Rape. And it's a. F we'll, we'll put it up. You know, you'll be able to see it. All right, are you guys ready for this? So, uh, repetition was an important strategy for Magritte. He had an ability to present figures in a suggestive yet questioning manner. Uh, he had playful and provocative sense of humor, which worked into many of his pieces. Um, to support to support himself, Magritte spent many years as a commercial artist, uh, producing uh, advertisements and book designs. And uh, this initial work, this most likely helped him to shape his art. A lot of um, Magritte's work showed up on postage stamps too, so it kind of gives you an idea of how known his art was. Um, some of Magritte, Magritte's most famous works employ both words and images. Uh, his works seem to declare that they have no mystery, yet, um, you know, looking at them, they are marvelously strange. The illustrative quality of Magritte's uh, pieces often result in a powerful, powerful paradox images that are beautiful in their in their clarity and simplicity but they also promo provoke unsettling thoughts. Magritte also put his own surrealist twist on other people's famous paintings and his work depicted similar and recurring themes. Um, some of his favorite themes were uh, floating rocks, painting paintings within a painting, and he used many inanimate objects within a human figure. You'll see a lot of like apples in his work and bowler hats. Um, <clears throat> and you'll notice in a lot of his work. Yeah, you'll notice in a lot of his works that um, it features a lot of things that may seem random and don't belong, but he always finds a way to make everything connect. Um, Magritte took everyday normal objects and simply rearranged them. Uh, he rearranged the figures and locations. And his art <laughs> um, <laughs> raised a lot of serious questions about the relationship be between um, painting and reality. Like, um, we'll show you um, his painting, Treasury of Images. And um, on the bottom, it says in French, um, this is not a pipe. And you look at the painting, you're like, well, of course it's a pipe, it's there. but really he tries to show the viewer that it's a painting of a pipe and it's not an actual pipe and stuff like that kind of like plays with your brain and that was Rene Magritte's goal. Uh, he often <clears throat> painted metamorphoses? Metamorphoses? <laughs> metamorphoses? I don't know. Uh, and he played with forms and colors that created visual illusions and he was also famous for working in two types of surrealism which were visual and conceptual. Okay, so now we're going to go into the analysis of Rene Magritte's work. And um, fun fact about him, he painted every day for 40 years, so naturally he had a lot of paintings and a lot of works. Whoa. Um I know, I can't even imagine, like, we'll have to do the math to see That'd how much crazy. that is. Yeah. He must have strong hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so I'm going to an anal uh, analyze um, about two or three of his well, we thousand analyze. works. Yes, we will. I apologize. But yes, 40 years every day that is a committed cray. artist that's correct yes okay so this painting is called the son of man by Rene magritte and um to me this painting is the epitome of Rene magritte's work because it has two themes um that occur a lot in his paintings and the first would be um the apple 
and the apple you see the like a green apple show up in a lot of his work and um, a lot of common objects show up in his work and um, the second theme is um, putting more normal objects in weird unusual context like just how this apple is levitating um, obviously this isn't realistic an apple can't just float like that um, and uh, also another theme a third theme that I noticed was um, this apple that's covering this man's face and a lot of people say that this is a self-portrait but you can't really tell because the apple is covering the man's face but um, <clears throat> this um, covering of this face occurs in a lot of his work and um, the next painting that we're going to be in a, um, analyzing is called The Lovers and um, you'll see that you can't see their faces either. There's a quote that um, Rene Magritte once said about this painting. He said, at least it hides the face partly. So you have the apparent face, the apple, hiding the visible but hidden, the face of the person. It's something that happens constantly. Everything we see hides another thing. We always want to see what is hidden by what we see. There is an interest in that which is hidden in which the visible does not show us. This interest can take the form of a quite intense feeling, a sort of conflict, one might say, between the visible that is hidden and the visible that is present. Okay, so overall, The Son of Man depicts three main themes um, that I just talked about. And um, this painting and the quote that I sh um, just told you guys um, kind of shows Rene Magritte's take on how humans constantly have the urge to see what is hidden. And these hidden objects, um, like I said, occur in a lot of his paintings. And speaking of which, we're going to go into The Lovers, and um, you'll, ex you'll see why they're related. As Sydney said, this painting by Rene Magritte is called The Lovers, and just by the looks of it, it looks kind of like I don't know, eerie and weird just because, like, two people's faces are completely covered up. It's almost like he painted a scene from, like, a scary movie or something like that. Something yeah. very awkward and exactly. weird. Um, I'm kind of curious as to what their faces are like on the inside of what looks to be, like, a, like a blanket or, like, a cover of some sort. And I'm also wondering why they're outside. I'm, um, I'm just wondering why their faces are covered in the first yeah. place. Like, To me it's really interesting because you see it looks like they're just taking a casual picture as if they don't know that they have their faces yeah, are cloaked. Actually, yeah. you know? So it's true. like they're acting like there's nothing there when there is something blocking their faces. And it seems like almost there's some kind of like, since they're acting like nothing's there, it kind of seems like maybe there's like another species out there that like is used to this kind of covering I don't know but the way that his like his body is like and his face is like pressed up against her cheek like it shows like that some kind of affection yeah here. some yeah. affection like some like they're passionate about each other but they're not letting they're not letting like the cover get in the way of their true love or something like that okay so now for the real analysis um, Rene Magritte, when he was younger, he was really uh, um, interested in the Phantomous films. Um, it was about a shadowy hero, um, and it was a thriller series in which um, a man never revealed his identity. The main character in these Phantomous films always had some kind of shroud or stocking over his head. So another source of the shrouded um, faces is when we talked about how Renee Magritte's mother committed suicide in a river and when he saw her body her nightgown was covering her face so that image always stuck with him and that played its made its way into his work and that kind of explains why he has um, a line of paintings where their faces are covered. And also as we said um, it seems like the couple is just they're just taking a normal picture and what this picture seems so casual but then the only thing that makes it so surreal and um, unusual is because their faces are covering it kind of shows a source of alienation or suffocation and death that he was feeling about his mother's death
Well, basically what Magritte wanted to do was uh, he wished to cultivate an approach that avoided the stylistic distractions of most modern paintings. He believed overall that we need to not look for the mysterious because it, it lurks everywhere in even the most conventional lives. So uh, like what he, what he wanted his point to get across was that that even you could you can find mysterious things even in um, normal everyday lives. Um, Magritte's work had a major impact on a number of movements, including the pop, conceptualism, and a number of the 1980s. A painting of the 1980s. Paintings <laughs> of the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> so after a fallout with fellow artist Andre Breton, Magritte moved back to Brussels, where he stayed for the remainder of his life. And, and later he started to um, work on sculptures, and I apologize for the dinging in the background. So that's Renee Magritte, Rene everybody! Renee Magritte, yo! Okay, so now we're going to talk about Salvador Dali, and I'm sure you've all heard this name before, um, because he's one of the most well-known surrealist artists. And um, in 1929, that's when Dali joined the surrealist movement, and he... Um, became the most um, controversial member, and you'll find out why later. And um, he was a sculptor, a painter, and a photographer, and he painted strong imagery of the realm of dreams. Also, what was so remarkable about Dali was that um, <laughs> his first works were exhibited when he was just 14 years old. Oh my gosh, it's so awesome. Yeah. So, in many of Dali's works, he uses complex obsessive symbolism deriving from both his childhood memories and psychoanalytic writing. So Dali moved to Madrid in 1922 after the death of his mom to devote more time to art. There he attended um, he attended a prominent art academy in Madrid and from his earliest years as an artist he exhibited his work widely, lectured and wrote. Although Dali was friendly with Picasso, as he was a great influence to him, he was never an imitator, and he always sought to incorporate cutting-edge avant-garde um, <laughs> wow. styles in his work. Dali's eccentric manners was a reflection of his art and vice versa in polarized opinions. Also, Salvador Dali constantly depicts the landscape of his homeland, one that became synonymous with the landscape of the imagination and of dreams. Woo. We are going to talk about specific works of Salvador Dali, um, and one of his muses that will play a part in the paintings that we're going to talk about um, was his wife Gala. She was one of his muses. Gala <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so... This uh, painting by Dali is called The Face of War. And so from the looks of it, it's really scary and uh, very ominous looking, very dark. When I think of Face of War, it, I think of um, a lot of scared, horrified faces because a lot of people, obviously the war isn't a good thing. And the, all these faces, even though it's like faceception, but <laughs> whenever they, whenever I look at these faces, like they look horrified, and that I think maybe that's sort sort of the story behind the name of the title or the name of the painting. And a, oh, and uh, around the like the biggest face um, seems to be like snakes, like leeches right? or something, yeah, like snakes like hovering around. And the faces um, really display a lot of uh, fear, uh, anxiety, and like disgust, and just nothing positive is. I, I don't see anything positive out of this, except for maybe like the blue little background. I don't know. I'm not sure, but oh yeah, and we did talk about how surrealists were against World War One and how mm -hmm. Dadaism and surrealism kind of founded it around um, the opposition of war and this face of war obviously Salvador Dali doesn't have a positive take on war and so I guess that kind of shows um, the surrealist feelings about war. So 
the face of war was painted in 1940 during the brief period of time that Salvador Dali lived in the state of California. And the period in which the painting was made was very, like, distraught. It was very, like, a, it was a bad time for most of the world. Especially for Spaniards, which Salvador Dali was. It was bad because the three-year-long Second Spanish Civil War had pretty much just ended, and it dashed the hopes of the fledging republic, which turned into a repressive dictatorship. And then World War II began pretty much around the same time, giving the entire globe an appearance of war. And this painting represents Dali's feelings of war, which he felt was just endlessly repeating death and decay. So if you look at the painting, the miserable face of the corpse sees death, speaks death, and reflected in his eyes are the corpses whose eyes and mouths are also filled with death. And Dali just in the lower right corner, Dali suggested and claimed that that handprint depicted there was his own. And then, so, war was a especially special topic for Dali because he claimed he could have premonitions of war and in fact that he felt the pain and destruction of bombings, which had not occurred yet. And then just one last point about this painting is that even if you are viewing this painting for the first time, which many of you probably are, it is clearly seen that suffering is illustrated through everything in this painting. All that meant from this painting is that war is death, and that's pretty much what how Dali felt. Okay, so this next painting that we're going to analyze is The Persistence of Memory by Salvador Dali. And, um... I guess this one is definitely surreal, and this is one of his famous, his most famous um, works. This is one of surrealism's most famous works. Yeah, this is basically shows like the when you think of surrealism, you've got to think about this painting because I feel like everyone has seen one version of this painting or another. Um, and here, this kind of makes me refer back to Rene Magritte's work because he took. Um, normal objects and put them in like an unusual context and here Salvador Dali took the clocks and showed them melting so it kind of shows them um dreamlike it's kind of a dreamlike state yeah I guess like in this painting time sort of doesn't apply like time doesn't exist in this painting. sort of disintegrating and it really shows like a like a dreamlike sort of sort of um landscape something that you would never see in the real world something that something that's um you would think of just like in your subconscious like what's going on in your mind yeah it seems very empty like you do in dreams there's not much that fill not much space that fills up when you have dreams and i'm really curious about like the little weird thing right in the middle of the I'm, painting it I'm looks not, like at first i thought maybe. it was like a pig <laughs> 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 i'm not exactly sure but this painting is pretty much the essence of what surrealism is. The Persistence of Memory by Salvador Dali was painted in 1931. And the meaning behind this piece of art is definitely, in a way, not easy to grasp, but there's a lot to it. So, the Oh, there are four clocks on display in this painting, and they, they're pretty much the only thing in otherwise an empty desert scene. And this might seem uncanny and not normal, but... And the clocks are not flat, as you might think at your first look at it. But... They are bent out of shape, appearing to be melt uh, melting. 
So there are many different ways you can interpret the this painting. One way is that it depicts a, a dream state. And if it does depict a dream state, then the melting and distorted clocks symbolize the erratic and weird, crazy passage of time that we experience while dreaming. Um, if we see the, if we interpret this painting like a dream state, like I said, then it seems like the clocks they are melting because they don't have any power in the dream because dreams there's really you don't keep time in dreams it's just you're dreaming so that's one way to interpret the painting there's another way to interpret it and some art scholars believe that this is what Dali was symbolizing is Albert Einstein's groundbreaking theory of relativity which was a new and revolu revolutionary idea back in the culture of the 1930s. And through the theory of relativity, Albert Einstein proposed a new concept of time as being relative and complex. Not something fixed and easily tracked with a gadget as, like a pocket watch. And in this painting, Salvador Dali shows the clocks melting away and thus losing their power and stability over the world around them. And through his melting clocks, Dali might be saying that simple machines like wall clocks and pocket watches are primitive, old-fashioned, and even unimportant in a post-Einstein world. As we've talked about many times already, the dream state is very important in surrealism, but also jokes, humor, sarcasm, and wordplay are also central ideas to surrealism art, or surrealist art. And in this, in the persistence of memory, Salvador Dali uses sarcasm in the title of this painting, and which is persistence of memory, which I've already said a few times that the clocks are losing their power in this dream world. They are literally melting away and seem anything but persistent in Dali's depiction. Also, the ants eating away the face of the red clock, which is in the lower left corner, also symbolizes the decaying and therefore unimportant nature of our arbitrary way of keeping time. One last way that you can interpret and see this painting is that the desolate landscape where the clocks are is also barren and infertile. There's nothing there, it's just a desert. And some art scholars notice the resemblance that this landscape and other Salvador Dali landscapes, which he have painted, have are somewhat similar to his beachfront hometown of Poor Legat. Not sure if that's how you pronounce it. But the possible it's some so this mean from that you get that this could just be a memory from Salvador Dali's childhood or from his past of his hometown just with like the clocks melting. And so from this painting, there are different things that seem like you've never seen them before. Like, they're just out there, crazy ideas, but they're kind of based off of things you could see in your everyday life. Like, one watch hangs on a tree branch like wet laundry to dry it, and then, the, but the branch is not flower, flowering or covered in leaves, but is sapped and dried out which shows how desolate and just not nice this landscape is. Dali painted this at an age of around 27 years old. So if we're looking for the autobiographical meaning of this, which is meaning like from his past, what he remembers, the clocks might be representative of his adolescence and are fading or melting away because Dali cannot remember them accurately now 
that so much time has passed since his childhood. While we can never know for certain the true meaning, interpretation, or analysis that Dali himself actually intended for his painting, it's most likely that all of these ideas that I just talked about were combined to create this painting. So in conclusion, um, Dali and his works really made a big impact on the Surrealist community. His depiction of the subconscious mind and dreamlike thoughts um, really grasped the essence of what Surrealism was all about. So, from the very beginning, emerging from the carnage of the First World War, Surrealism demonstrated a rigorous faith in the possibility of changing life and pursued this end with unswerving determination. The backbone of the movement was the members' unshakable idealism, providing a framework that could encompass many diverse styles, interests, and personalities. So the organized Surrealist movement in Europe dissolved in the onset of World War II, and um, some people see Surrealism as the most influential movement in the 20th century. And um, even though Surrealism was most, was most prominent in literature and visual arts, it lightly affected theater, dance, and music. Figures like Dolly and Man Ray brought the style to a huge popular audience through fashion, photography, advertising, and film. Um, surrealist painters such as Miro um, would be an important influence on the abstract expressionism in the late 1940s. The surprising imagery, deep symbolism, refined painting techniques, and disdain for convention influenced later generations of artists. Pop culture and art world were extremely influenced by Magritte's unique ability to take something so ordinary yet make viewers see something completely different. Surrealism was a major alternative to the Cubist movement, movement and also it was largely responsible for perpetuating the mod er, modern painting and the traditional emphasis on content. The post-war years saw many attempts to resuscitate surrealist activities, but the group struggled to find a sense of unity and purpose. There was an insurmountable gulf of time between the new, the new young adherents and the veteran members of the group. And while the Paris-based surrealists grouped around Breton still emphasized the political motivation of the movement, for many others, uh, surrealism had taken on new meanings. Surrealist politics and poetics had diverged, and new artistic currents inevitably, inevitably took over. So like all other movements, surrealism eventually died out. Most artistic movements eventually burn themselves out. But it is a testament to the enduring spirit of surrealism that has not only lasted as an official movement for over 40 years, but is also still an important influence on art today.